Ray has just been jailed for the murder of Martin Luther King. In war-torn Biafra, four million people are facing starvation. And floating a quarter of a million miles away in space, three astronauts are about to make the greatest technological endeavor of all time. Houston, Texas. NASA flight director Eugene F. Krantz is awake early. A Korean War Air Force veteran, he is a patriot and a devout Catholic. Last night, he attended Mass at his church, the Shrine of the True Cross. But beyond his religious faith is Kranz's belief in the space program. Not just a part of his life, it is his life. When he is at work in mission control, he always wears a waistcoat made for him by his wife, Marta. Today is no exception. But this waistcoat will be worn for what will be the most exceptional shift of his career. Two hundred and thirty-nine thousand miles above Houston, the three astronauts of the 11th Apollo mission are still asleep in the command module Columbia. For the last 17 hours, they've been in orbit around the moon. 38-year-old Neil Armstrong from Ohio is in charge of the mission. With him are astronauts Edwin, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins. Last night, Collins volunteered to keep watch while the other two astronauts got some rest. He's to stay in orbit in the command module while Armstrong and Aldrin attempt to land on the moon in the lunar module Eagle. In 23 minutes' time, they will wake to begin their journey into the unknown. Steve Bales spent the night in the mission control bunkhouse. Never particularly good at waking up in the morning, this is one day on which he couldn't afford to oversleep. It is his first job since leaving college, but at just 26 years old, he is already a Space Center veteran of five years. He doesn't know it, but later today, the whole of the Apollo mission will rest on his shoulders. As flight director, Krantz has overall responsibility for the lunar landing. Around the world, millions of people will be watching live as America attempts to do something that has never been done before. For Krantz and the 400,000 people who have worked on the Apollo program, the stakes are high. The potential for failure is infinite, but if they succeed, it will be a dramatic climax to a race that began eight years earlier. On May the 25th, 1961, at the height of the Cold War, John F. Kennedy made what would be one of the most important speeches of his brief presidency. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Kennedy took the Cold War into space. The mission, to put a man on the moon before the Russians, was the most costly project ever undertaken. Krantz had been there since the beginning. Joining NASA in 1960, he'd flight controlled on both the Mercury and Gemini projects. But Apollo was different. Its mighty Saturn V rocket engine had finally given man the power to break free of the Earth's gravity. 
Krantz flight directed missions 5, 8 and 9. He'd been there through each success and every setback, including the launch pad fire that killed an entire crew. Apollo 11 had successfully taken off four days ago. It was 2,974 days after John F. Kennedy's speech, almost six years after his assassination. Ten, nine, ignition sequence start. Orbiting the Earth one and a half times, the third stage engine boosted Apollo 11 out of Earth's orbit and on to a lunar trajectory. Traveling at an initial speed of 24,200 miles an hour, the three-day journey to the moon was relatively quiet. Yeah, it seems very comfortable, but uh, after a while... It had been accomplished twice before. The sight of men in space was no longer startling. Right, so you, uh, you tend to find a little corner somewhere and put your knees up or something like that to wedge yourself in. And that seems but Apollo 11 had one major difference. Apollo 11 was going to land on the moon. Eight o'clock. Krantz arrives at mission control and takes over the flight director's chair. Apollo 11, Houston. Ah, now we're coming in. Uh, can't quite make out who that had. That's uh, big Mike Collins there. Well, you got a little bit of... Yeah. Hello there, sports fans. You got a little bit of me, plus Neil's in the center couch, and Buzz is doing the camera work this time. They are about to embark on the most risky phase of the mission, the descent to the surface of the moon. In orbit above the moon, Buzz Aldrin crawls through the hatch into the lunar module. He starts checking the systems in preparation for the powered descent. Krantz makes his first entry in the flight log. 95 hours and 41 minutes mission elapsed time. White team, descent. Crew in lunar module, pressurizing preps. All looks good. He looks over the first row of flight controllers in the place they call the trench. The controllers have a nickname for Kranz, General Savage. There is the communications officer. His job is to ensure Eagle maintains a strong radio signal with Houston, so the controllers have good data and can communicate with the spacecraft. The flight surgeon will be monitoring the health of the astronauts through individual electrocardiogram readouts. There is guidance officer Steve Bales. His job is to oversee the computerized flight control system that will take Eagle down to the moon. And directly in front of Krantz is astronaut Charlie Duke, CAPCOM, the capsule communicator. He's the point of contact between Krantz's team and the Apollo mission. Over. It's his voice that the astronauts and the world will hear. Orbiting the dark side of the moon, Eagle and Columbia are out of radio contact with Houston. With Armstrong and Aldrin in the lunar module, Collins is ready to separate Columbia from Eagle.
Collins releases the spring-loaded bolts of the docking mechanism, and Eagle drifts gently away. Armstrong fires small bursts of Eagle's thruster rocket, turning the lunar module on its head in preparation for the descent to the moon's surface. Nicknamed the Flying Bedstead by astronauts in training, Eagle's balance is maintained by its onboard computer. The peak of 1969 technology, its 74 kilobyte memory, is less than a modern mobile phone. Collins starts his vigil orbiting the moon in Columbia. Privately, he has given some thought to the odds of them safely accomplishing this mission. He estimates a 50-50 chance of success. If things go according to plan, he won't see Armstrong and Aldrin for at least 22 hours. If something goes wrong down there, it's unlikely he will ever see them again. Mission Control still has a half-hour wait before the spacecraft come back into radio contact. Krantz tells his flight controllers to be back at their posts in 15 minutes. Procedures in flight, will you make sure the doors get secured now, please? Krantz orders security to lock the doors to mission control and switches Procedures to a private communication group. Will you secure the doors? Roger. Then, after reviewing operational procedures, he gives the pep talk of his life. This is the best team I've ever worked with. I have ultimate confidence in you people. What we're about to do now, it's just like we do it in training. And after we finish the son of a gun, we're gonna go out and have a beer and say, damn it, we really did something. Collins clears the moon two minutes before Eagle and establishes contact with Houston. Columbia, Houston, we're standing by, over. Houston, Columbia, reading you loud and clear, how many? Roger, bye, bye, Mike, uh, how did he go, over? Listen, babe, everything's going just swimmingly, beautiful. Great, we're standing by for Eagle. Eagle then clears the moon, but Mission Control has a problem receiving their signal. Communications from the spacecraft have been cutting out and then returning for brief moments. Apollo 11, this is Houston, how do you read, over? Apollo 11, Apollo 11, this is Houston, do you read, over? Krantz is nervous. In only a few minutes, he will have to give Armstrong and Aldrin the go-ahead for the mission, and his controllers need good data. Charlie Duke suggests that Eagle pitch 10 degrees to improve signal strength. Eagle, Houston, uh, we recommend uh, you all 10 right will help us on the uh, high-gain signal strength, over. Eagle, Houston, uh, we have you now. Do you read over? Loud and clear. Okay, we're off to a good start. Play it cool. With an improved signal, Krantz asks his flight controllers for a go or no-go for the descent. Okay, all flight controllers, I'm going around the horn. Make your go-no-goes based on the data you had for at LOS. I see we got it back. Give you another few seconds. We're going flying. Okay, retro. Go. Fido. Go. Guide. Go. Control. Go. Telcom. Go. GNC. Go. Ecom. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom. We're go to continue PDI. Roger. You're a go to con you go to continue power descent. You're a go to continue power descent. With eagle in position, they are about to start the part of the mission that has Roger. never been attempted before: the man descent to the surface of the moon. Only 50,000 feet above the moon, Armstrong and Aldrin are strapped to the floor of the lunar module. Their mouths are dry from the pure oxygen in the capsule. The computer will take Eagle down to 500 feet when Armstrong will take over control for the landing. The descent engine fires and the lunar module vibrates with a high frequency hum. Eagle is face down, traveling towards the moon at a mile a second. Armstrong looks out of the window to check for landmarks but each checkpoint is appearing two seconds ahead of schedule. At their current rate of descent, 
they are likely to overshoot the planned landing site by two miles. Team foot, we're going to make it a thing. Roger. He thinks you're a little bit long downrange. That's right. I think we confirmed that. We confirmed that, Roger. Guidance officer Steve Bales is worried. Eagle is descending too fast. 20 miles an hour faster than planned. If the descent rate increases, Eagle is likely to crash land but the speed is constant. They can overshoot the planned landing zone and Armstrong should be able to find a new suitable site. Eagle turns over onto its back so that its landing radar can lock onto the moon. The radar comes to life, firing information on speed and altitude into Eagle's guidance system. Aldrin checks the computer's calculations against the distance measured by the radar. Because of the fast descent rate, the two are out by several thousand feet. He tries to input the new data from the radar into the computer. Hey, program alarm. An alarm goes off on the computer. 1202. 1202. Aldrin has never seen this before. He has no idea what a 1202 alarm means or how serious it might be. Mission control, and Kratz is under pressure. With an alarm active, the lunar module's computer is liable to crash. Kratz has to decide whether to abort the descent or override the alarm and hope for the best. Suddenly, the most important man in the room is Steve Bales. Whether the entire mission is go or no go is now down to the 26-year-old guidance officer. But Bales isn't sure what the 1202 alarm is either. During simulated landings, three seconds was considered a long time. It takes 15 for mission control to give Neil Armstrong an answer. The entire mission hangs on Bale's call. The astronauts need an answer. Give us a reading on the 1202 program, Alarm. We're, we're going Roger. that flight. We're going that alarm. Roger, we got you. We're going that alarm. Bales thinks the alarm is the result of a computer overload, so it keeps resetting itself. Another alarm. This time a 1201. Roger, 1201 alarm. We're going that flight. 1201 alarm. Same time we're going flight. Okay, we're going. Then another 1202 alarm. Roger, 1202, we can't. With the alarms now coming Go. on top of each other, Bales overrides each one. Go. 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 We're go. Same time. We're go. Bale's decision allows the lunar module to continue its descent. Inside Eagle, Aldrin updates the computer with the new data. But the mission is about to enter its most risky phase. Okay, all flight controllers, gonna go for landing. Retro. Go. Fido. Go. Guidance. Go. Control. Go. Telcom. Go. GNC. Go. Ecom. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Houston, you're go for landing. Over. Roger, and then go for landing. 3,000 feet. Okay, all flight controllers, hang tight. Should be throttling down pretty shortly. Halfway through the powered descent, Eagle's engine throttles down. Still under computer control, it pitches over into its landing position. Armstrong checks the altitude and speed, 5,000 feet up, 100 feet per second, just as expected. Flight Fido, let's go real good. Raj, Fido, good. Velocity down now to 1,200 feet per second. You're looking great, right, uh, Eagle. How you doing? Control. We look good here, Fido. Raj, how about you, Telcom? Go. Guidance, you happy? Go, Fido. Go. Now, with the moon only 1,000 feet away, Armstrong looks out of the window. He does not like what he sees. 
In mission control, the flight surgeon sees Armstrong's heart rate rise from 77 to 156. Eagle is heading straight for a crater littered with boulders. It's far from ideal as a landing site. Armstrong initiates altitude hold. Eagle lurches forward and is rocked by violent shudders as he fires the pitch control rocket. Just 350 feet above the moon, Eagle clears the boulder field and Armstrong flies on in search of safer ground. In Houston, the incoming data tells them that Armstrong has taken control of the lunar module. Low level. Low level. Low level. They can also see that his use of the thruster has left Eagle dangerously low on the fuel. For the first time today, Krantz and the controllers are powerless. The whole mission is now down to just two men. All they can do is listen to Armstrong and Aldrin counting down the distance to the moon and hope that the fuel doesn't run out. Eagle has only 60 seconds of fuel remaining. But Armstrong has found a landing site. Only a hundred feet separate Eagle from the moon. They have seconds of fuel left. Twenty feet to go. Armstrong wrestles with the controls. He has to bring it down level, otherwise touchdown could shatter Eagle's legs. Upon landing, Armstrong is supposed to shut down the engine. But he's so absorbed in flying, he momentarily forgets. Okay, engine stop. Krantz quietens his controllers. The flight plan calls for a possible emergency liftoff. Krantz asks the controllers if it is stay or no stay. Okay, T1, stay, no stay. Retro. Stay. Title. Stay. Guidance. Control. Stay. Telcom. Stay. GNC. Stay. Econ. Stay. Surgeon. Stay. Capcom, or stay for T1. Roger, Eagle, and you are stay for T1. Over. Eagle, you are stay for T1. With a unanimous stay, Armstrong and Aldrin power down most of Eagle's systems. The flight plan has a four-hour rest period scheduled, but there is no reason to wait. Armstrong suggests that the most dramatic part of the mission starts ahead of schedule. With Eagle safely on the moon, Gene Krantz and his white team hand over to a new shift. They attend a short press conference, but are keen to get back to witness the high point of the mission. Armstrong opens the hatch, moves through the opening, and out onto the ladder. He pulls a D-ring on Eagle's side, and an equipment stowage tray lowers. On the big screen in Mission Control, an alien black and white image flickers into life. Armstrong reaches the bottom rung of the ladder. He pauses. Then he launches himself into a slow motion fall, landing on the foil covered footpad. Very, very fine grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. Carefully, he raises his left foot and lowers it onto the dust. 
With no wind on the lunar surface, Armstrong's footprint will remain undisturbed for millions of years. Roger, the EVA is progressing beautifully. They're setting up the flag now. Later, Armstrong and Aldrin will unfurl an American flag, stiffened with wire, so that it will give the impression of flying in this airless world. Posing for Armstrong's camera, Aldrin reads the plaque that will remain on the lunar surface. Around the world, 600 million people, one-fifth of the world's population, are watching live on television. It is the largest audience for any event in history. One small step for man, begin to battle one giant belief for mankind. After two hours and 31 minutes on the moon, the two astronauts climb back inside Eagle. When they take off their helmets, they smell a pungent odor that reminds Armstrong of wet ashes in the fireplace. It is the smell of moon dust. At last, they prepare for a rest. They have been up since 5.30 Houston time. In a few hours from now, the two astronauts will blast off from the moon and rendezvous with Michael Collins in the command module. A final burn of their rocket will set the astronauts on a journey back to Earth and a hero's welcome. Neil Armstrong will enter the history books as the first man on the moon, Buzz Aldrin as the second, and Mike Collins as the astronaut who went with them. Gene Krantz will go on to flight direct four further Apollo missions. Steve Bales will be awarded the Presidential Medal of Honor for his part in the lunar landing. Go. A total of 12 men will ultimately walk on the moon, the last on December the 11th, 1972. The first today, on July the 20th, 1969, 66 years after the Wright brothers' first flight. <laughs>